Salutations and welcome to Ralph Reads. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me for the continuation of Horson, the story of a ghetto pimp, written by Donald Goins and published in 1972 by Holloway House, a trademark of Kensington Publishing Company. Kings and Queens, not to waste any more time. Let the reading commence. Chapter 5 When my fourteenth year on this bittersweet earth came, I felt as if I were a man. Jesse and I stood at just about the same height now. My hair was black, with thick curls that hung down upon my brow. Whenever I went up on the corner with Jesse, I could feel the admiring glances the whores would throw my way. A few would even joke with Jesse about when would be my coming out date. On these occasions, I would remark to Jesse that I was ready to pimp, but she would only laugh and cap. You think you know how to talk slick, boy? But that ain't the key. Anybody can talk out of the side of his neck. What you got to do is find the key, honey. I can't give it to you. I can only tell you where to look for it. You got to learn how to sell conversation, baby. At this time, I didn't know what she meant by finding the key. I knew I could think and talk fast. Plus, I knew all the latest slang. I got some beef that sells better than hamburger. The first time I screamed this on Jesse, I don't know if she wanted to slap me or not. She had raised her hand, but I stepped back out of reach. She looked at me sadly. Had I been older, I might have been able to read doubt in her eyes. Pimping is an art, Horson, she told me seriously. There are very few pimps in his world who can really take the title of being a pimp. Just because a man gets his money from a whore, that doesn't make him no true pimp. Real pimps are really rare. To prove her point, she reached down in her sweater and fumbled around. When she removed her hand, she held a small roll of money. She put this into the palm of my hand and closed my fingers over the bills. Count it, she said. I'm going to continue working. When you think I've made enough money, tell me, and we'll go home. I counted the $18 on my way to the Pigfoot joint on the corner. Tony and Milton were loitering around the jukebox. There was a booth full of young girls next to the jukebox, and they yelled at me playfully. I was in the process of convincing the girls to go up to my house so that we can use the bedroom when Jesse entered the restaurant. My back was turned to the door so I didn't notice her. The kids in the booth got quiet. I turned around to see what the matter was, only to find my mother bearing down on me. She stopped in front of me and held out a five dollar bill. I didn't know what to do so I took the money. Her eyes didn't hold a hint of a smile. Just as suddenly as she entered, she turned and retraced her steps without speaking. I felt a little self-conscious, so I stuffed the five-dollar bill down into my pocket without flashing my roll. The last thing I wanted was for the kids to think I got my money from my mother. Tony wouldn't know where I got my bankroll at, but they wouldn't, and I had no desire for them to start getting the wrong impressions. Had I really understood Jesse's intention, I could have avoided the next incident just by going outside. But I was unprepared when she popped back in the door. She hadn't been gone ten minutes. I stared at her coming across the floor, bewilderedly. 
I held out my hand for the $10 bill she carried loosely. In a voice that sounded shriller than the one I normally used, I heard myself asking, You ready to go in, Jessie? Jessie had never been ashamed of anything she did to my knowledge. She knew that she was embarrassing me. This only aroused her sense of humor. It's up to you, sweet meat, she said, referring to the statement I made earlier. She ran her hand through my hair. I'm ready whenever you're ready. I really wanted to stay and shoot the bull with my school friends, but I was embarrassed by the way Jessie was acting. Given the choice of staying or leaving, I quickly accepted the latter. Had I been as old and wise as I thought I was, I would have realized that many people would get the wrong impression of our relationship. Being as naive as I was, the only thing that disturbed me was that people would think all the money I handled came from Jesse. Many sly looks were cast our way as we walked out of the restaurant from the older people as well as from the young crowd. Jessie had a way of walking that made people think a queen was going past. To carry myself with such pride was my desire. On her way home, Jessie started to cough. I held her arm as she bent over and spit up a mouth full of blood. You all right, Jessie? I'm as well as any nigger woman can hope to be, she answered lightly. For the first time that night, I was glad we were going home early. When we got home, Jessie slipped into a house coat while I fixed some coffee. She came into the kitchen and sat down across from me. She had removed her makeup and, with it, the professional air she carried when she worked. I smiled with happiness. I realized that I loved this tall, strange, beautiful woman. She gave me one of her rare smiles. There was an understanding between us that was wonderful. Apparently, Jessie understood better than I that we were all each other had. I went to the cupboard, removed two cups from the shelf, and rinsed them out in the sink. We always took this precaution so we wouldn't have to worry about drinking a roach. I poured us both some coffee before sitting back down. Without taking her eyes from mine, Jessie placed a small bundle of reefer down beside my coffee cup. It wasn't difficult for me to recognize the ten joints I had rolled that morning. They still had a blue rubber band around them. Leaving them under my pillow had been a mistake. I had meant to retrieve them earlier, but had forgotten. To try and lie out of it would bring down instant punishment by whatever means lay near her hand. From past experience, I knew she wouldn't hesitate to throw the coffee cup at me if I lied. Jessie hated lies with a passion. I stared at the reefer, hoping that my hand wouldn't shake too bad. I reached boldly for the reefer. After removing one from the group, I tossed the rest on the table in front of her. Removing a book of matches from my pocket, I lit the joint and took a deep drag. Jessie silently stared across the table at me. Neither of us had spoken yet, nor was I going to be the one to break the silence. She got up from the table and walked into the other room. Soon, the sound of Billie Holiday singing her troubled blues came drifting from the record player in the front room. Jessie returned and picked up a joint and lit it. We sat at the table smoking reefer and talking till the sky began to get light outside. One of the many things she warned me about that night, one, was never to use any other drug but reefer. She made me promise that for no reason would I allow someone else or myself to shoot some heroin in my veins or snort it up my nose. I wasn't worried about using horse. I had seen what shooting stuff did to Tony's mother, so I had no desire for that form of drug. We were both lit up pretty well when we staggered up from the table that morning. Jessie had made a short trip down the street and got a bottle of wine to go with the weed, so we had become quite high. Her laughter rang out to welcome the sunrise as I helped her to stand. The flickering rays of the new day played tag across the wall as we staggered towards her bedroom with me holding her up. After I had put her into her bed, I leaned down to kiss her on her lips, but she turned her head quickly to avoid it. I drew back and stared at her surprise. She drew my head back down and kissed me on the cheek. 
There, you're a big boy now. Save your passionate kisses for your young girlfriends. Before I could tiptoe out of the room, she had rolled over and gone to sleep. The following weeks became difficult for me. Jesse continued to hunt me down in whatever restaurant, pool room, or doorway I happened to be loitering in. It became so obvious that she was giving me her trap money that Tony remarked, Man, why don't you tell Jesse what people are saying? I stared at him amused. If I knew what they were saying, I'd tell her. He laughed at my reply. Time after time, as we walked home from school, he looked over at me and laughed. We continued down the street, but soon I began to get weary of his humor. The more irked I became, the louder he laughed. A group of boys came through a yard carrying a case of wine they had stolen. It was Head and his gang. He had received his nickname because of the size of his head. It was longer than a football, with lumps in the back of it. He was short and wide, with a flat nose from too many schoolyard fights. His gang was the only one in the neighborhood anywhere near as tough as ours. And because he was their leader, he was always trying to prove how mean he was. They spotted us and stopped. All eight of them were roaring drunk. I realized that this could be trouble, so I watched Head closely. In school, on many occasions, we had started out joking, only to end up talking about each other seriously. I knew that for some reason, Head had a dislike for me. He handed Tony his bottle. I would offer you a drink, Horson, but I don't let white niggas drink out of my bottle. All of us went to the neighborhood movie each weekend, and we had just seen a cowboy picture where an actor had made a similar remark. I grinned at what I thought was his idea of joking and remained silent. Tony took a long drink and then handed me the bottle. Man, didn't you hear what I said? Had yelled angrily at Tony. The children in front of the broken down houses stopped their playing to watch. Their mothers came out on the crumbling porches like roaches flocking to garbage drawn by the imminence of violence. It was in the air, something intangible, felt by all, but seen by none. Fuck you, head, in your big, black ass, Tony replied quietly. I took a long drink from the bottle and then held it out towards head. He knocked the bottle from my hand, breaking it on the ground. I wouldn't drink after no bastard that pimps off his own mammy. He snorted loudly. Man, why don't you be cool? Tony said softly. Anytime somebody's mama gives them money, some ignorant son of a bitch could call it pimping. That's different, had stated and stared at me with his beady red eyes. This half-white freakish bastard is fucking his mammy. Before the words had left his mouth, I'd reached across the narrow space and grabbed the head. My right hand seized his shirt while my left exploded on his chin. I followed this with a knee to his groin, and when he bent over, I strained him up with my knee. Blood shot all over my clothes, and I busted his nose with left and right hooks to the head. I knocked him out into the street. I ran after him and kicked him in the face. This is how the police caught me when they drove up behind us. I was still kicking him in the head and face. I had learned earlier in my childhood the art of street fighting. Violence was a way of life, and I was dedicated to being good in anything I participated in. The police took us downtown. Before taking me to juvenile, they dropped head off at a receiving hospital. He was in need of medical treatment. I sat in a small room and waited for my mother to arrive. After what seemed like a two-hour wait, a tall, white-haired man appeared and led me into another room where my mother waited. 
Jessie rushed over and examined me for any injuries. She seemed so concerned that I decided not to tell her what the fight had been about. I didn't want her to have any unnecessary worry, so I remained silent as we left the building. Evening had come over the city. Dark clouds covered the sky as we walked down darkened streets in search of a cab. Jessie put her arm around my shoulder and spoke slowly. Not that I give a damn about what they say or think, Horson, but I just never realized what some low-minded bastards would think after seeing me give you my money every night. We stopped walking for a moment while Jessie fumbled around in her purse. She removed a small notebook. Each page in the book was dated, with a notation in ink following each day as to how much money she had given me to hold that night. After each week, she had added the total for all seven days. I stared at the book in confusion. I still couldn't comprehend her reasons for keeping notes on the money. I returned the money to her every night after she quit work. In a sudden fit of humor, she laughed at my perplexity. Darling, this is just a record to show you what kind of whore money not to accept. If any of your girls should bring you this kind of money, it will mean you're not pimping, you're simping. Oh yes, she added laughing rambunctiously. Thanks for giving me a vacation. I have never known if she resorted to scorn intentionally that night or if my ignorance really was that amusing. Whatever the reason, it got the job done. From that day on, I knew I would never accept schoolgirl money from a woman again. When we continued walking with her arm around my shoulder and her laughter ringing in my ear, I clutched the notebook tightly. It served its point. Besides teaching me what kind of trap money not to accept, it taught me that a woman would test her man at all times. I knew then that I would one day pimp and pimp good because I was going to pimp with a passion. Chapter 6 after being awake all night and most of the weekend, Jessie and I were in a hurry to get home to bed Sunday morning when she finished work. The square working people in the neighborhood had started drifting by on their way to church, dressed up in their Sunday best. We passed Milton with his parents coming down the sidewalk. He winked at me, but I refused to acknowledge it since he was damn near grown and still too frightened to speak when he was with his mother. His mother made some kind of comment. What a shame. But we were walking too fast to hear all of what she said. Jesse seemed as tired as I was. We ran up the stairs to our flat. She was halfway undressed before I could close the door. Her blouse was tossed over the back of a chair. She had wiggled out of her skirt and tossed it on the couch. I was in the process of running her some bath water when somebody started banging on the door. Before I could get there, Jessie opened the door wearing only her half slip and bra. Tony rushed into the room with tears streaking his cheeks. Jesse, he sobbed. You gotta come, Jesse. Mom's done took an overdose, Jesse, and ain't nothing I do seems to help her. For the first time in my life, I realized that Tony really cared about his mother, though there had never been the harmony between them that there was between Jesse and me. From the many times I had been over to his house, I had yet to notice anything other than indifference between the two. Idly, I wondered how Jessie would refuse to go. I knew she didn't particularly care for Tony's mother, especially not enough to go back out after working all night. To my surprise, she simply turned and began to put back on her skirt and blouse. Unexpected as this was, even more surprising was the fact that she hadn't even cursed. In less than ten minutes, we were climbing the steps to the four-room apartment where Tony lived. The door was already open when we got there. The woman who stayed across the hall was standing in the doorway, crying. She looked at Jessie and shook her head. It's too late, honey. She done passed away. Tony rushed into the bedroom. Jessie and I followed silently. There wasn't anything anyone could do for her. She lay on the bed, decently covered, with her eyes open. 
Even for someone as inexperienced as I, the awareness of death in the room was inescapable. The tears that Tony shed seemed inexhaustible. Tears rolled down Jessie's cheeks, smearing her makeup. Everyone was crying, but me. I turned and left the bedroom. This was a new experience for me, and I was really shook up. I needed some fresh air to remove the smell of death from my nostrils. Without stopping in the living room, I crossed the carpet and opened the door leading to the hallway. Before I could get through the door, two burly policemen came marching into the room. Behind them came the elderly couple who lived downstairs. Is this the boy? The last officer asked the woman following them. I shook my head. This time I knew I wasn't the boy they wanted. Nah, she answered. That ain't him. One of the officers went into the bedroom. In a few moments, he reappeared with Tony and Jesse. Before long, the apartment was full of people, most of them police officers. Jesse went over in the corner and talked to a detective. I saw her write out something on a slip of paper and hand it to him. Then she came over and herded Tony and me out of the room. We walked back home in silence. Jessie in the middle with her arms around both of us. The sadness of the occasion overwhelmed us, leaving room for sleep only. The week following the funeral, our way of living became, to some extent, more orthodox. Jessie stopped working at night and got a daytime job in the cleaners. She wouldn't allow Tony and me to gamble anymore. Plus, we had to be in the house by 8 o'clock every night. We were becoming frustrated by this imposed curfew, and this frustration showed in our relations with Jesse and everyone else. Jesse was responsive and sensitive to our feelings, but she would not tolerate any disrespect. She continued diligently with her job while making us walk a straight line. But all her efforts were in vain. After Tony had been with us for a week and a half, a policewoman stopped by the house. Tony and I had just come in from school. Jessie was still at work, so the woman put us in her car and drove over to the cleaners. The woman went into the cleaners and came out after a short while, followed by Jessie, who seemed to be pleading with her. It was the first time I had ever seen her beg anyone. I hoped it would be the last time. The harder she seemed to beg, the more the woman would shake her head in refusal. Tony realized how useless her pleas were before I did. He opened the car door and got out. Taking Jesse's hand, he kissed it slowly. She turned and stared at him, surprised. It's no use, Jesse, he said. I'll always remember how hard you tried, though. She drew him close and wrapped her arms around him, tears in her eyes as she kissed him. It was like a hammer hitting me when I realized that Tony was being taken away. I jumped out of the car. We stood on the sidewalk and hugged each other, our tears flowing unashamedly. Had I known it would be years before we would meet again, I still could not have wept harder. After the woman left with Tony, Jessie went in and quit her job. On the way home, she tried to joke about the job, but I believe in my heart that she would have stopped hustling and kept her job if it would have helped to keep Tony. Jessie bought a bottle of gin, and that night she got roaring drunk. At times, she would laugh and shout. At other times, she would cry. When she attempted to go to work drunk, I went and got Big Mama, and she helped me bring Jessie home and put her to bed. For a while, I was consumed with loneliness. After my initial shock about Tony wore off, I resumed gambling and petty stealing. Had I been an introvert, I probably would have been more sensitive to my close friend's problem. But after really appraising the situation, I realized that sentiment was useless. Even before Jesse advised me to quit worrying because there was nothing we could do, I had reached the same conclusion. You have too many problems of your own to cultivate other people's trouble. Usually, I spent most of my leisure time on Hastings, but since I was becoming so well known to the hustlers who hung out on that street, I had to go farther to find my action. One day, I wandered into a small restaurant on Brush. A tall, slim, light-skinned woman was bent over picking up some trash. I leaned on the counter to admire her legs better. She was bow-legged and wide across the rump. Her hair was raven black and hung down on her back. 
I knew she hadn't heard me come through the door because it had become a habit of mine always to enter as silently as possible. She must have sensed my presence behind her because she turned suddenly and caught me staring in fascination. She seemed startled at first, but her look was bold and penetrating. Suddenly, I became uncomfortable. She had dark green eyes, which reminded me of a cat's and a long, keen nose. Her complexion was the color of burnt copper, and to me, she looked like a goddess of love. Usually, I could stare at a woman and make her drop her eyes, but this time, I had to drop mine. She seemed to undress me with those green eyes, and I got the impression of something cold and hard about her. I pushed my hair back off my forehead and gave her my innocent smile to fake her out. She smiled in return, revealing lovely teeth, and the caddish look disappeared. After our first meeting, I began to stop by the restaurant every day. I knew that Fatima liked me, even though there was a ten-year difference in our ages. One afternoon, I found her sitting at a table by herself, dressed in her street clothes. This was the first time I had seen her without her white uniform. The green dress clung to her body. It was cut low in the front, and I could see the roundness of her breasts. My breath caught in my throat, and I could feel my blood rushing to my head. Desire for this woman had become an obsession. I wanted to possess her completely. She stared up at me, and I knew she could see the anxiety in my eyes. Without speaking, she slipped out of her chair and stood in front of me. We were the same height, but the heels she wore caused her to tower above me. Taking my hand, she led me from the restaurant. The other waitress stared after us curiously. Fatima waved down a cab. When we got in, I settled down on a seat beside her as the cab jumped in and out of traffic on its way across town. Her hand found mine on the seat as she placed it between her legs. I was in seventh heaven, and until this day I cannot recall the location of the apartment she took me to. We entered the apartment and stopped inside the door. Somehow, she managed to close the door and slip into my arms in the same smooth motion. I could feel her tongue slipping around inside my mouth. It felt like a hot, flaming spear. Everywhere it touched, it aroused erotic emotions. I had been kissed by girls many times, but nothing like this. Her mouth was hot. Her breath felt like a hot wind blowing upon my neck. I could feel her body radiating heat through her dress. She slipped out of my embrace and pulling me by the arm led me into her bedroom. We both began to remove our clothes quickly. Fatima finished undressing first. She helped me remove my pants and lightly shoved me back upon the bed. The room was well furnished. The walls had been lately painted a shocking pink, while the dresser and matching pieces were snow white. It was a showroom displaying the feminine traits of its occupant. I could feel her kissing me tenderly on the legs and thigh. She removed my silk shorts, and I heard her catch her breath in surprise. I smiled because I knew what had given her a shock. I was aware that nature had been exceptionally nice to me in a certain department. Suddenly, I could feel her hot breath on my privates, and I began to tingle all over. The boys and I had discussed blowjobs before, and while I had spoken on the subject like an expert, this was my first experience. Wow! It was like standing up in bed while still lying down. My head and my heels were the only things touching the bed. I felt like screaming, but held back in anticipation. At the final moment, I grabbed her head and pushed against it and held it to me at the same time. Later, I flopped back on the bed exhausted. Fatima got up and went into the bathroom. After washing up, she returned to the bedroom and asked, Would you care for a drink? I nodded in agreement and watched the sway of her hips as she walked into the living room. 
In a few moments, she returned carrying two water glasses filled to the brim. I tasted the drink she had given me. It was whiskey mixed with very little soda. I had drunk wine before, but never any strong spirits, because the burning stuff would cause tears to spring into my eyes. I started to set the drink down on the table beside the bed. Fatima caught my hand and pushed the drink towards me. Be a big boy, honey. I ain't standing for no shit about you not getting high with me, she said huskily. I didn't want her to know I hadn't drunk anything stronger than wine, so I turned up the glass and drained it. It was so strong, it almost took my breath. Somehow, I managed to hold the drink down. Fatima emptied her glass, then lay beside me, and we kissed for a while. Suddenly, she got back up and went to refill the glasses. I really didn't want another drink, but my not wanting to reveal my inexperience caused me to try to match drinks with her. Sitting cross-legged on the bed, Fatima began to shake out some white powder onto a magazine. I watched her in dread. I had never snorted drugs before, but I knew them when I saw them. Removing a book of matches from the table, she tore off a strip from the back cover. Taking a strip and putting a crimp in the middle, she used it like a shovel to scoop up some of the white drug. Holding one nostril, she put the powder into the other one and snorted. The powder disappeared as if by magic. She refilled the quill and pushed it towards me. I turned my head sideways and sat up on the side of the bed. Don't be afraid, honey. It's only a little cocaine, she whispered, her laughter following low and husky. I trembled with an unknown fear. I could hear Jesse's warning roar in my head. Don't ever take any drug other than reefer. The small amount Fatima had taken didn't seem to disturb her much, so I tried a little bit. The more I snorted, the higher I became. Her hands roaming over my body aroused sensual sensations I'd never experienced. Everywhere she touched became sensitive. My nerves became raw, and they tingled with unheard of pleasures. I lay back upon the bed as my keen sensibilities blazed with passion. I felt one of her legs rest upon my chest. In moments, I became aware of my neck being caught in a lengthwise grip between her thighs. She began to thrust her lips with a steady force until the continuous pressure produced a light discharge that seemed to spray my face. Anger and hate twisted inside my gut as the notion ran through my mind that she had made a freak out of me. Pushing her aside, I ran into the bathroom and washed my face thoroughly. I stuck my head under the spigot in the bathtub and risked my mouth out. I could hear Fatima standing in the doorway laughing. The more water that ran over my head, the clearer my mind became. As I stood up, I faked a drunk stagger. She laughed again and came forward to help. I hit her with a straight right to the head, causing her to tumble all the way back in the bedroom. I followed her quickly, but instead of finding an unconscious woman, I ran straight into a wild cat. Her naked body gleamed in the dim light as she met me in the middle of the room, snarling like an animal and clawing like a cat. I shot hook after hook to her head. She was bleeding from nose and mouth, and for a moment I had doubts about being able to whip this grown woman. She got a grip on my hair and dug her claws into my cheek. I could feel the pain as she raked the side of my face. Remembering that the best way to stop a woman was to hit her in the stomach, I shot a left and right to her gut. She folded up like a bag. I put one on her exposed chin. She exploded against the wall. Most of the fight was out of her as she sank to the floor, but I had no intention of quitting now. I walked over to the closet and removed the coat hanger. As I twisted the wire together, her eyes followed me the way a hurt animal watches his killer. She began to whimper as I picked up a pillowcase and wrapped it around my hand so the wire couldn't cut me. Her screams seemed to shake the walls as I laid into her. I continued beating her until I was exhausted. I sat on the edge of the bed resting as I watched her crawl across the floor towards me. 
she began to kiss my feet passionately, with whimpers of pleasure escaping from her with each caress. When she kissed her way up to my knee, I kicked her in the head, knocking her back to the floor. I knelt down across her body and slapped her across the face. Then I started to ravish her savagely. She dug her nails into my back while her screams shattered the silence because I was deaf to her cries and continued to rape her. Chapter 7 I staggered from the apartment in a daze, wandering down unfamiliar streets with my face caked with drying blood. The left side of my face had three long scratch marks where Fatima had dug her nails in. I continued on aimlessly until the darkness of the approaching night surrounded me. When I arrived home, I was surprised when Big Mama opened the door for me. I entered the flat and turned my head so she wouldn't notice my scratches. When she spoke, her voice was low and urgent. Horson, you go wash that blood off your face and change clothes. Hurry, boy. Jessie is real sick, and she's been calling for you. After washing and changing shirts, I rushed into Jessie's room. Two of the girls who worked out of Big Mama's house were in the bedroom. One of them helped Jessie while she sat up. The other one hand-fed Jessie some soup from a bowl she held. Big Mama towered over the women, watching their movements closely to make sure there were no mistakes. I walked over to the bed quietly and looked down. Jessie caught my hand and smiled weakly. There seemed to be no strength in her grip, and as I looked down on her, I realized that she was very ill. She stared at me with tense and penetrating eyes. Suddenly, she turned her head to cough. My heart shook with fear when her parched lips became covered with blood. The woman holding her gently leaned back against the pillows. At times, she coughed so hard that her body trembled and shook. She tossed her head from side to side as though the pain was unbearable. Then suddenly she would recognize me, and the dark shadows behind her eyes would leave for a few moments, and she would rest peacefully. With the arrival of the doctor, her breathing became less difficult, and she seemed to sleep. I went into the living room and waited until he came out. After he left, Big Mama said something about Jesse having consumption. At that time, this didn't mean anything to me. The following week became a nightmare. Jessie didn't get any better. She just lingered on. As the days drifted past, I couldn't help but get the impression that the two women from Big Mama's were getting tired of playing nurse. If one of them told me she would be there at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd be lucky to see her before 4 in the afternoon. Big Mama came every day, but somebody always showed up later in the day to fetch Big Mama to settle some trouble at her house. Jessie had a little over $500 saved, and we had been using some of it to pay the doctor and buy medicine. One afternoon, the rent man showed up. I left him sitting in the front room while I went to get the rent. Jessie was sleeping when I entered her room, so I tiptoed over to the closet. I put my hand down in the lining of the old coat where the money was kept and came up with my fingernails full of dust. My mind was rocked by the thought of someone having beat us for our stash. Snatching the coat from the hanger, I turned the lining inside out. The money was gone. In my panic, I ripped the lining completely out of the coat. There was no money. I turned around in a daze, too hurt and dumbfounded to think. I wanted to cry, but tears would not come. Suddenly, I realized that Jesse was awake and watching me silently. My mind began to function more clearly. I pulled myself together so she wouldn't become aware of our trouble. I knew that Big Mama wouldn't have taken the money, so that left the two whores. My whole being was consumed with a cold, deadly hate. Is all of it gone, Horson? She asked in a frightened voice. My silence only confirmed her suspicion. Walking over to the bed, I took Jessie in my arms and tried to console her. I begged her not to worry, but there was murder in my heart. When she stopped crying, I fixed her pillows for her and went back into the living room. The rent man had become agitated over the delay, and when he saw me, he started to frown. My anger was just about to reach a boiling point, so I walked over to the door and opened it. The 
You'll have to pick your money up next week, I said, holding out his hat for him. He must have read something in my face because he took his hat and left without too much grumbling. I closed the door and leaned against it. I knew what I had to do. With no money in the house and a sick mother to take care of, my childhood came to an abrupt end. Suddenly the bedroom door opened and Jessie stood there with her street clothes on. There was a stricken look about her, but her face was full of determination. Her body swayed as though she was being driven by a strong wind. I rushed to her side and caught her in my arms before she fell. Horson, put me down, boy. I'll be alright. I just ain't been on my feet in a long time. There was desperation in her voice, but she was so weak that she knew it would have been impossible for her to even walk up on the corner, let alone catch a trick. Her tears soaked through my shirt as I carried her back to her room. Much later, after Jessie went to sleep, I went into my bedroom and dressed with the utmost care. After combing my hair the way the girls liked to see it, I closed the door silently behind me and left the house. The kids running up and down the street waved in my direction. Milton and two other guys from my gang met up with me and walked along until I came to the restaurant. We stood outside and looked through the window. Fatima was bending over the counter taking the customer's order. Cautioning the guys not to follow me unless they saw me get into trouble, I entered the restaurant. Fatima didn't notice me until I reached the counter. After placing a hamburger on the cooking grill, she turned and saw me. Her hand flew to her mouth and her eyes grew large with fear. Making my stare cold and harsh, I beckoned towards her with my head. My voice snapped at her like a whip. Take that apron off. I got something else for you to do other than fry hamburgers. She stood there too shocked to move until I stepped behind the counter. I don't know what I would have done if she had continued standing there, but she saved me the trouble of finding out. She took a quick look at my set face, then removed her apron and started to climb over the counter. Not that way, bitch, I growled. Come on around this way. She recoiled slightly when our eyes met. Why are you looking at me like that, she asked as she started past me. When I slipped my arm around her waist, I could feel her stiffen. I remained silent until I had led her out of the restaurant, ignoring the inquiring stares that followed us. When I ran my hand down over her body, she relaxed under my arm. Her mouth turned up in a smile, and I knew she was scheming fast and furious. I decided to keep her unbalanced. Seeing an empty doorway, I pushed her into it and slapped her. Stark fear sprang up in her eyes, and she backed up in panic. My words drummed at her, giving her no time to think. Bitch, I'm taking you up on the track to work. The tricks spend from three dollars on up. It's up to you on how much they spend. I just don't want to hear that you turn down anything over three dollars. That's rock bottom, you understand? She was slow in answering, so I slapped her again. Her head bobbed up and down in reply. I want you to turn at least three tricks an hour. At three dollars a lay, that's nine dollars an hour, ninety dollars and ten dollars. I stepped back from her. Now, bitch, do you think you could get my trap money together without causing me to kill you? She mumbled something in agreement. Taking her by the arm, I led her to Hastings Street. I stuck so close to her on the track that she didn't have the time to try to run away. While she stood in the doorway hustling, I stand across the street and watch her. When she caught a trick, I'd follow them into the trick house and wait until she finished. After the trick left, she would come out of the bedroom and give me the money before going into the bathroom and washing up. That night, after she had finished catching dates, I knew she was hooked. Fatima had taken to whoring like a fish takes to water. Because of my concern for Jessie, I pulled Fatima up from the track before midnight. Earlier in the evening, I had given a girl I knew from school five dollars to go to Jessie and stay with her until I got home. Just like a good whore, Fatima complained that the tricks had just started to ride good, so she wasn't ready to go in. 
The money she had made was in the 80s without counting the five I had given away. We stopped in a greasy spoon restaurant and ordered two dinners to go. While waiting on our order, Fatima walked over to the jukebox. Loud laughter caused me to glance around and see a tall, brown-skinned stud with a thick mustache getting up from a booth occupied by the two whores who had been coming to see Jesse. I felt like exploding on top of both of them, but I curbed my anger. Walking over to the table, I stared down on them. They stared up at me in mock surprise. Hi, whore son. I see you done got chose, one of them said before they broke out in laughter. It was easy to see that they were high off weed or coke. They were not aware of the deadliness welling up inside me. I had to turn away or I would have killed one of them. My glance went to Fatima. She was trying to pry their pimp's hand loose from her arm. A blinding rage consumed me. My control slipped completely away. Grabbing a pop bottle off a couple's table, I rushed at the tall man's back. He must have heard me coming because he dropped her arm and turned quickly. With the full swing of my arm, I caught him square in the face. If I hadn't caught him by surprise, he probably would have killed me. He was full grown and I was only 16. The surprise attack plus the bottle equalized the fight. I didn't give him any air. He fell back against the jukebox with his arms outstretched. I kicked him viciously between the legs. He almost turned green. As he fell forward, I grabbed a handful of processed hair with my left hand and burst the bottle with my next swing in his face. Blood and teeth spattered the floor. A warning scream from Fatima caused me to whirl around. Both of his whores were charging and they meant business. The first one had a knife, while the second one had a bottle. Fatima tripped the first one when she rushed past to get me. I stepped back as she sprawled on the floor in front of me and kicked her in her face. The second one was on top of me with the bottle. I took the first blow on my upraised arm before she could hit at me again. Fatima caught her behind the head with a chair. After that, I could take my time. While Fatima kept one girl busy, I stomped the other one in the face till her nose broke and most of her teeth were stomped out. When I finished with her, I turned and pried the bottle loose from the one Fatima was tussling with. Breaking the bottle, I bent down and pinned the second whore to the floor with my knees. With the knowledge of what they had done to me and Jesse burning in my breast, I took the jagged edge of the bottle and cut up her face. Fatima turned as pale as death when the blood flowed. She twisted her head away and started to puke. I didn't give her time. Grabbing her arm, I hustled her out the door. Before we had crossed the street, a police car squealed to a halt. When they rushed into the restaurant, I led Fatima through a gangway that ran directly to an alley. We cut across alleys and between houses until we wound up in my backyard. Dropping her hand, I led the way up the stairs. She followed me into the house like a well-trained French poodle. Just about out of breath, I sat down in the chair in the front room. I caught her staring at me with a look of horror on her face mixed with something like admiration. Betty, the young girl I had paid to watch Jesse, stood in the bedroom door smiling. She was a tall, thin girl with big eyes and so knock-kneaded you could pick her out in the crowd. How is Jesse doing? I asked quietly. She fell asleep just before you came in, whore son, but your mother is sure sick, she answered. Fatima spoke suddenly. You ain't afraid somebody might bring the police, whore son? I hadn't given the problem any thought. Now that she had brought it to my attention, I realized that it wouldn't take long for some informer to lead the police to my house. I had enough game about myself not to allow my woman to see me undecided. Since I really didn't know what to do, I decided to play strong. Pimping was a 24-hour job, but I meant to pimp 25. Bitch, turn that wall loose and get in the bedroom and find you a house coat.
I want to hear your bath water running in three minutes, plus have a sweet smelling whore in five. She moved like she had been shot out of a cannon. When she came out of Jesse's room with the house coat, she was running so fast that before I could point out the bathroom, she had run into another bedroom. Before I could call her a bunch of dumb bitches, she had found the bathroom and the sound of running water could be heard. Betty stared at me in wonder. You always said you was going to pimp, didn't you, Horson? Our eyes met. She was looking at me in a particular manner. Ain't your mother gonna worry about you, Betty, if you ain't home? She laughed harshly. Shit, Horson, my mama done got drunk off that five dollars and went to bed with some man somewhere. Besides, it don't make her no difference if I don't never get home. That's one less mouth for her to feed. You mean your mom won't say nothing if I pay you to stay here and take care of Jesse? I asked quickly. She replied bitterly, My mother wouldn't say anything if I moved in here with you, Horson, except to warn me not to bring no babies back, expecting her to take care of them. There was a strange light in Betty's eye that I couldn't make out. You wouldn't mind sleeping on the couch, would you? I asked. She wet her lips with a tongue. Betty was staring at me the way a hungry dog watches a bone. It made me uncomfortable. There was something inflexible about her look, causing me more discomfort than I'd ever felt from a woman's stare. It seemed like an eternity before Fatima finished her bath. When she came out, I had stretched out on the couch. Just to have something to do, I massaged her back, legs, and shoulders. She purred like a large cat under my hands and my gentle kisses on certain parts of her body. We were interrupted by heavy footsteps on the stairway. I snatched Fatima up from the couch and we ran in the bedroom. Someone began pounding loudly on the door. With a warning to Betty that she hadn't seen us, I closed the bedroom door. Leaning against it, I took Fatima in my arms and held her close. I could feel her trembling from head to foot. Big Mama's familiar voice relieved some of the tension. Horson, damn you boy, get out here! Opening the door slightly, I peeped out. Big Mama was standing in the middle of the floor with her hands on her mammoth hips. Move, boy, damn it! She roared. You ain't got too much time! Fatima and I entered the room like two frightened chickens. Big Mama glared at me with eyes blazing. I ain't got the time now to find out why you and that yellow whore of yours messed up them two girls, boy. But you better have a good reason when I have time for you to explain it. I started to sputter out an explanation, but she cut me short. Boy, the police is coming. They know your name. They know you did the cutting. Now all they got to do is to get someone to show them where you stay. My mind was racing a mile a minute. I knew I had to get away, but I didn't have the slightest idea where to go. Fatima was staring at me with complete confidence. If she had been able to realize how completely at a loss I was, I believe she would have run off. Big Mama came to my rescue. I left the car downstairs, Horson. The driver knows where to take you. Her voice was full of fury as she continued. I want you to make damn sure you stay there and keep that whore with you too until I get there. I could tell her temper was just about at the exploding point and when that happened, Big Mama went into her violent bag so I got out of her sight real quick. The last thing I wanted was for Fatima to see somebody with me. With a few clothes tossed together, I stopped in the bedroom and spoke with Jesse for a moment, then departed, not aware that it would be the last time I'd see my mother alive. Chapter 8 We had been hiding in a flat right off of Hastings Street. After two weeks, the room had started to become smaller and smaller. Big Mama had stopped by on three different occasions. The first time she showed up there had been nothing but smiles for us. Jessie had explained to her about the $500 getting stolen, and since the girls had been wife-in-laws, all of us figured that the money had been taken by both of them. Betty came over twice a week to do our shopping. The only thing Fatima had to do was cook and pester me about making love. When we went to bed, she seemed to have more arms than an octopus. After I pried one hand loose, she always managed to secure a firm hold with the other. One afternoon, while we were going through our wild wrestling match on the living room floor, we were interrupted by someone pounding on the door. Fatima went to the door. I was surprised to see Betty because she had done our shopping the day before. There were tears in her eyes when she stopped in front of me. 
A sudden apprehension overcame me. Before she spoke, I knew that what she had to say would be bad. You better come quick, Horson, because I think Jesse is going to die. Fatima and Betty ran after me as I rushed from the flat. Die? Jesse couldn't die. I thought while making that frantic dash. In my shock, I didn't even notice the cab sitting in front of the house. The girls jumped in the cab and caught me before I reached the corner. When we reached our destination, I leapt out of the vehicle before it came to a halt. I ran up the stairs. Entering the living room, I was vaguely aware of the people milling around. I rushed into the bedroom. Big Mama, tears streaming down her cheeks, stood aside to let me reach the bed. Jessie lay as though she was sleeping, except that the chill fingers of death had given her a tranquility that would never again be disturbed. Falling upon her, with my arms clutching the slim body to me, I remained motionless with my head pressed to my dead mother's bosom. Realizing that I would never see her smile again, hear her laughter, have the joy of just being with her, was unbearable. The sobs started deep within me, where they hurt. There were no tears, just long body racking sobs that shook my whole being. I can't recall how they pried me loose from the body. I remember that Fatima and Betty kept calling for Big Mama to give them some help, but I can't recall whether she helped them or not. For the next two days, I wandered around our flat in a daze. Big Mama took care of the funeral arrangements. Betty, not wanting to return home, moved in with me and Fatima. All three of the women who really cared about my welfare had a difficult time convincing me not to attend the funeral. I was still so set on going that Big Mama, as a last resort, hired a man to take me and my two ladies out of town. The same day that they buried Jesse, we were on the highway. I sat in the front seat next to the driver. It was a short trip. An hour and a half after leaving Detroit, we stopped in front of a hotel in Flint, Michigan. The driver began setting our bags on the sidewalk. Fatima went in and got us a room with twin beds. I followed them into the hotel and up to our room as if in a trance. Day turned into night and I still remain in a state of total bewilderment. Fatima undressed me and laid down beside me. I remained motionless even after the sounds of the night people ceased to be heard from the street. Fatima called my name softly twice. Then the springs of the bed sounded as she got up. I could imagine her staring down at me, but I kept my eyes closed. In a moment, I heard the bed that Betty was in squeak. They whispered to each other quietly. I turned my head slightly. My eyes were already accustomed to the dark, so I could see them embracing very clearly. I watched in silence. The bed they were in began to squeal from their contortions. Without being observed, I reached the lamp and pulled the lamp cord. Light flooded the room. Both women were nude, with Fatima on top. They reached hastily for the sheet, but it had slipped or been pushed to the end of the bed. Fatima's eyes grew large with fear as I stood up. I smiled down at the prone women. Don't let me disturb you, ladies, I said, then walked into the toilet. I removed my silk shorts and stepped under the shower. It was hard for me to accept the fact, but I realized that it wasn't the girl's fault. They didn't feel the same grief that I had to endure. Jessie had been my mother and mine alone. Then the tears began. I hadn't cried before, but now the tears flowed fiercely. With the door locked and the noise of the shower covering my sounds, I let loose all my pent-up torment. After quite a while, I stepped from the shower and stared in the mirror. I knew that Jesse would have been ashamed of me. Here I was, acting like a baby, the first time pressure was put on me. Jesse had always thought she was raising a man. Now, I was flipping over to a punk's role. This wouldn't do at all. Her words rang in my mind. First be a man, whore son, then be a pimp. Shoving the door open, I stepped into the bedroom. I felt that I was already a man, and pimping was my destiny. Leaving my shorts on the floor in the bathroom had been an oversight. Standing between the two beds naked made me regret this absent-mindedness. No man is at his best when he confronts two women in a nude. Fatima had climbed back in her own bed, so this eliminated most of my problem. I stared down at Betty coldly. 
so you want to fuck, huh, bitch? I sneered. Reaching down, I ripped the sheet from her hands. She had been clutching the sheet up around her neck, and now she put her hands unconsciously over her breast for cover and lay there staring up at me in terror. I laid down on top of her and grabbed a handful of hair and kissed her ruthlessly. The more she tossed and turned and tried to get away, the more my passion was aroused. When I penetrated her, she screamed. I took her the way a stallion would take a mare. With ruthless strokes, I pushed myself deeper and deeper. She began to moan feverishly. Raising up on my elbows, I started to pile drive my way to the promised land. Hearing a wild laugh behind me, I looked over my shoulder and saw Fatima trying to spread Betty's legs wider. Betty started to scream again at the top of her lungs. Fatima let go of her legs and clapped a hand over Betty's mouth. With her other hand, she grabbed a handful of hair. Releasing Betty's mouth, she bent down and hushed her cries of pain with savage kisses. When the pre-dawn light began to show through the window, I rolled over on top of Betty again. Her voice quivered. No, no, not yet. Please shut up, bitch. Fatima snarled as she rolled over to enjoy herself. You know goddamn well you like it. For an answer, Betty put one arm around Fatima's neck and pulled her down to kiss. With her other arm, she pulled me down towards her bare breasts. Later in the afternoon, I awoke to find both of the girls gone. A chill ran through me. This was a strange new terror, one that stays with any man who lives off the earnings of a woman. His very existence depends on the loyalty of that woman. When his woman goes to a store and stays too long, he begins to worry. If she should stay exceptionally long on a date, fear builds up inside him until he hears her steps upon the stairway. A prostitute will run off from a man she has been staying with for the past ten years without any warning. She will leave him at any minute, hour, day, or night, taking with her only the clothes on her back. The only thing a pimp can be sure of is that the rent is due or his car note needs to be paid. Jumping from the bed, I rushed to the closet with fear pounding in my heart. Their clothes were still there. I slammed the door and leaned against it weakly. Where could they be? I didn't think they would have run off without taking some of their clothes. I reopened the closet and counted the suitcases. There was nothing missing that I could see. I sat down on the bed with my head in my hands. Suddenly, I heard steps in the hallway. My heart skipped a beat. Holding my breath, I waited and prayed. The sound of the key being put in the lock put an end to my anxiety. Lying back on the bed, I cursed my stupidity. The first thing I should have checked for was the key. They came into the room laughing and carrying dinners. The aroma from the soul food caused my stomach to ache from too many missed meals. I ate slowly and listened to their constant chatter. They had never seen so many white tricks as they saw up on Industrial Street. This was due to the fact that a car factory was right across the street from all of the bars there. Whore son, Fatima said happily. I met a girl who was working the streets and she took us to a trick house where we could turn our tricks for a dollar. She went on excitedly. A dollar each time you use the bedroom ain't too much, Daddy, cause the tricks up here don't spend under ten dollars. Betty was just as happy. She pulled out a twenty dollar bill and held it out to me timidly. While we was at the house horsing, this man come in and he didn't want to see nobody but me, she said cheerfully. The John thought Betty was a schoolgirl, Fatima added without malice. You know, I couldn't get that bitch to spend no part of that 20. She borrowed a dollar from me for the use of that room. Then the hussy wouldn't break that damn bill to pay me back. At that moment, I really believed I held the world in my hand. I smiled at both of them. Then I lay back on the bed and relaxed. How sweet it is sometimes to get your money off the top of the dresser. The following week, my bankroll grew swiftly. I met a pimp who went by the name of New York and moved my small stable over to his house, taking the upstairs flat. 
There have been a family of squares renting the three-bedroom flat from him, but when they found out he was running a whorehouse downstairs, they got indignant and moved. New York had five prostitutes living with him, three white girls and two colored ones, plus four French poodles running around the downstairs apartment. It was a madhouse, also one of my favorite homes. New York pimped and pimped hard. The only time I can remember one of his demands being ignored was when he spoke to the dogs. New York was not only a small built man, he was short. With his shoes on, he couldn't have stood over 5'5". He wore his hair processed, and he always kept it neatly done. His eyes had a coldness that was hard to overlook. But when he smiled, he revealed beautifully even spaced teeth. He dressed the way only a small, neat man can. His personal grooming was perfection in motion. Our flat became the trick house. All the girls from downstairs brought their dates up to my flat to take care of their business. Our three bedrooms in my flat stayed in constant use. When the girls from downstairs came up with a carload of white tricks, I'd make myself scarce by taking the back stairway down to New York's house. We did this so that if the police raided, everyone wouldn't go to jail. After I moved upstairs, New York made it a house policy that no white men were allowed downstairs. In fact, he wouldn't even allow his white insurance collector inside the house. His reasons for doing this were logical. If the police had his flat under observation, any white man entering would give them reason to kick the door down. We had an agreement that if my door got kicked in, he would pay half the fine. I was young and both of my ladies were just as inexperienced as I, so we didn't realize that New York had everything in his favor with this agreement. While we had everything to lose, Lady Luck was smiling down on me at this stage of life and I didn't have to pay any dues for my ignorance. With the money rolling in daily, I started taking my two ladies shopping regularly. We would go downtown and spend the whole afternoon going in and out of various stores. Fatima picked out a diamond-studded watch for me that cost $700. Then she talked me into buying her a mink stole that cost $1,400. Betty, on the other hand, got to bring her present home the same day. With Fatima pushing her, she picked out a leather coat for 200 fat ones, and I paid for it out of my pocket. It took a little while to pay off the bill for my watch and Fatima's mink, but she arranged the payments in such a way that we paid off both articles on the same day. When we got home after picking them up, she ran upstairs to change clothes while I went to find New York to show off my watch. Chapter 9 New York listened silently as I raved over the delicate quality of my watch and the exquisite beauty of Fatima's mink. He removed his watch from his arm and put it beside mine. There was no comparison. To match my watch against his was as disastrous as pitting a baby kitten against a full-grown dog. His watch had two rolls of diamonds going completely around it while mine had one. Where the bands connected, there was a cluster of diamonds, whereas on mine, there was none. I had always known that his jewelry was superior to anything I could purchase off the whore money I was getting, but my excitement over buying my first diamond-studded watch had led me to act rashly, and now complete embarrassment was my reward. All five of his girls were lolling around in the front room watching us. When he compared our jewelry, they giggled. New York caught them with his glance, and the sound froze in the air, but the damage had been done. I felt like jumping in a hole and covering the top up for the duration. There was a knock on the door. Before anyone could open it, Fatima came parading into the room, hands on her hips, impudently flaunting her mink. She moved with the grace of a live, sinewy leopardess. How do I look? she inquired, and turned with that leopard-like motion. Instead of looking at me for an answer, she stared directly at New York for her compliment. Her face was lighted up with a rare beauty. It was almost shocking. It demanded that you acknowledge its superiority. New York returned her stare as though in a daze. I think he realized at that moment that Fatima was the most beautiful woman in the house.
I sensed something passing between them, but I couldn't understand what it could possibly be. Poor son done gave me the night off, New York, she whispered, but he can't get in no bars cause he's too young, so I'm stuck for a date. If I hadn't felt foolish before, I did now. I wanted to choke her till she turned blue. I wished I had never purchased that damn mink. I was beginning to learn, but my dues hadn't come up yet. If horse son don't mind, New York replied easily, I'll take you out so you can show off your new outfit. I wanted to say no, but the angry looks on the faces of New York's ladies caused me to give my agreement. They were staring at Fatima with pure hate. I couldn't understand why they resented Fatima going out with New York. She was my woman, and if I didn't show any resentment over the date, I felt they shouldn't either. Had I known then what I know now, I would have realized that they just considered me a young fool. Fatima rushed out to take her bath and put on her evening clothes. New York asked me to take a ride with him while he waited on Fatima to dress. I followed him out of the house and waited in the driveway till he backed his caddy out of the garage. I sat in the car seat and tried to look clever. The motor ran so smooth and silent that I wished for the thousandth time I was old enough to buy my own car. Poor son, New York began. I'm going to run something down to you, man, because I kind of like you. You know about as much about pimping as a monkey knows about flying an airplane. I was stung and hurt by his words, but before I could stutter a reply, he continued, waving me to silence. Just listen, baby, just listen. First of all, your main lady is a bull diker. He didn't ask me, he just made a frank statement, and he went on ruthlessly. Fatima likes pussy as much as you do. His voice was harsh. That bitch of yours will spend money to freak off. I know this for a fact because she done already turned tricks with three of my girls. I muttered something about killing the whore, but he didn't give me time to finish the sentence. Horson, I ain't telling you this so that you'll go home and jump on Fatima. Baby, I'm pulling your coat so that you'll never let another bitch tell you how to spend your money. You're wrong, New York. I don't let my women tell. He interrupted me with laughter. His laugh was so hurting that I stopped trying to explain. What you mean I'm wrong, baby? Just what the fuck you think you have been doing? He cursed sharply, then lowered his voice. Listen, baby, I'm going to explain it to you just one time. So listen close. Your main lady played on you. Ain't no ifs and buts about it. The bitch played boss game on you. First, the bitch had you spend 1500 for the mink, plus 200 for an alligator purse, then a cool hundred for some matching shoes, and we don't even have to count all the dresses you bought her that cost over $50. Add up all the money you spent for your watch, suits, shoes, then maybe you'll dig just how far ahead that bitch done got on you. There was no need to count. Once New York had mentioned it, I realized how the bitch had played on me. He didn't even know about all the cash money I'd given her to send home for the care of her two children. Stopping for a red light, New York lit a cigarette. Dig, baby, it ain't no sense in violence. If you're as cool as I think you is, just give Fatima her propers, baby. She put boss game on you. Can you dig it? I'd give the bitch her propers, all right, I thought angrily. To pimp, whore son, he said arrogantly. You got to have style. I don't mean copy it off somebody. Like, for instance, the way you imitate my walk. I've even heard you try and mimic the way I talk. In fact, baby, I've seen you duplicate my hand motions. I blushed like a schoolgirl. His words hurt, mostly because what he was telling me was the truth. I had tried to walk, talk, even act the way I thought he would on certain occasions. But for him to put it out in the open like this really showed me how foolish I'd been acting. Ignoring my embarrassment, he continued, Now, I'm not the only one who has noticed this, Horson. My girls remind your ladies of this fact with expressions that have made serious problems flare up. He reached over and turned the radio off. His next words exploded in the silence. 
In fact, horse son, my whores have made fun of your limitations so much that your bitches are so tired of being mocked about it that they're both going to choose another man. His words jerked me upright. You better take me home, New York, I replied with more firmness than I felt. I'll try to straighten this matter out. I hated to make an apology, but I managed to stammer out a few words. The only reason, man, uh, try to dig this. I've, uh, yeah, idolized you, I'll admit, and copied your walk. He interrupted. Don't make no excuses, baby, and not to me. I realize you're still a kid, Horson, and for a kid your age, you're doing all right. But you still got a lot to learn. That's the reason I'm going to the trouble of pulling your coat, baby, because I don't want to see you blow no more whores like this. I knew what he was saying, and then again, I didn't. I hadn't blown any whores yet, and I didn't plan on losing any. I dig what you're saying, New York, so I'll be able to tighten my game from here. I ain't planning on blowing no whores now since you done pulled my coat. He smiled at me real friendly, then pulled my world down on top of me. Horson, he said quietly, you ain't got no whores, baby. When we left the house, my girls went upstairs to help yours pack. They done chose me, Horson. The words have been spoken quietly, but the message came to me loud and clear. I had taken him for a friend, but the friendship had only been respected by me. At that stage of my life, I wouldn't have accepted one of his girls if she had come to me. That was something Tony and I never did mess with each other's girls, but New York wasn't Tony. I trembled with rage, not because I had lost my whores, but because I'd let my admiration for New York make me completely forget Tony. I realized with anger that I'd forgotten to send Tony any money since my involvement with this so-called friend. New York said something. I had to bring my thoughts back from the spreading fog to understand what he was saying. Dig, baby, I ain't gonna let you down up tight, horse son. I'm gonna give you the money both girls make for the next two days, baby. That way, you can get yourself together, baby, cause I really dig you. I laughed sharply. If them whores done chose you, mister, the only thing you can do for me is have some bitch call me a cab so that I can get the fuck out your house. New York got mad. You ain't got to take that attitude, baby. After all, the game is cop and blow. I was quivering. I had to fight down the urge to kill him. One day, New York, I'll see you, and instead of looking up to you, I'll be looking down. You was blowing the bitches, he yelled angrily. If somebody was going to cop them, it might as well have been me. You might as well learn now than later, whore son. When it comes to whores, you don't trust your brother. Anyway, you ain't ready for no bitch like Fatima. Me now, I know how to handle her. What you should have did, whore son, was send her to a whorehouse so that when she freaked off with another bitch, she have a chance of pulling a new whore for you. He shrugged his shoulders to emphasize how simple it was. What you did wrong, he added, was to let Fatima tighten Betty. Now, instead of losing one whore, you blow two. He pulled the Cadillac into his driveway and stopped. All the lights were out in my flat. Horse son, he said quietly, you ain't got to take no cab. I'll drive you wherever you want to go. This was too much. I stepped out of the car, but at the sound of his voice, I stuck my head in. Motherfucker! I screamed at him. I don't want you to do nothing but stay the fuck away from me! My understanding is completely zero. So you and them bitches ain't got shit to say to me. Do you understand, bitch-ass motherfucker? New York didn't answer. He just stared at me and shook his head in agreement. And I realized that he was frightened. The fear in his eyes smoothed my anger. Some of the girls had heard us pull up in the driveway, and now they were standing on the porch. I knew they had heard everything I'd said to him, so before I closed the car door, I tried to humiliate him. If I ever see you anywhere, punk, downtown on the track, in the streets, and you look at me too long, sucker, I'm gonna get knee-deep in your ass. Then I added for emphasis, 
If you keep frowning, sucker, like you don't like what I'm saying, I'll get in your ass now! He stared straight ahead, not looking in my direction, his hands frozen to the steering wheel. I could sense the struggle he was having with himself. Even a fool can comprehend certain facts at certain times, and I began to grasp the reason for New York to ignore my insults. It wasn't that he was so afraid of me, he just didn't want any trouble. He had caught my girls, so why fight? Later in life, I would meet up with Betty in Detroit, and she would remind me of this night and tell me that New York had a pistol, but he really liked too much, so he didn't shoot me. He slowly regained his composure and smiled coldly. We'll meet again, horse son. Maybe by then, you'll have learned something about pimping. I slammed his car door shut. His girls watched me climb the stairs. There were contemptuous glances shot in my direction, but I stared at them so scornfully that they dropped their eyes. There was a burning passion in me to kick New York's door in and drag both my whores out and kick them in the ass till their noses bled. The only thing that kept me from going on the wild was my earlier teaching. Jesse had always taught me that I was better than five whores. If a bitch ever left me, it wasn't my loss, it was hers. Her words rang in my mind. You don't need no bitch, the whores need you. Don't fight a woman just because she wants to leave you. Help her pack, give her cab fare, then go out yourself and have big fun. Don't let a bitch living get the idea that she is hurting you by leaving. If anything, make her believe she is doing you a favor. Tell the bitch that since she is leaving, that's one less worry you'll have. With these thoughts in my head, I straightened my back and went on up the stairs. My bags were sitting in the front room, packed. I smiled. They had really crossed me out of the picture. I sat down on top of a suitcase and pondered my problem. I still couldn't shake the feeling of shame. The sound of a horn blowing in front of the house woke me from my stupor. I walked to the window and looked out. A taxi was parked in front of the house. Raising the window, I yelled down for him to wait. I picked up my bags and went down the stairs. I knew that I had blown my first horse, and I also knew that they wouldn't be my last. We have reached the ending of this episode of Ralph Reads. I would like to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. Please connect with me via Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at rgmc2407. Send an email to rgmc2407 at gmail.com. And if you would like to leave a small donation, please do so via paypal.me forward slash rgmc2407 or the cash app. My cash tag is rgmc2407. On YouTube, you can find me on rgmc Ralph Gar Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, as well as the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the continuation of this miniseries on Ralph Reads. Y'all be easy.